how would you rate the relationship today between the United States and Europe? What kind of a grade would you give it? And um, I mean, if you look back at the beginning of the new transatlantic agenda in 1995, how far have we come along that road? Well, we've, we've figured out better ways to work with each other, but we haven't really truly harmonized and moved in the direction of standards and mutual recognition that would actually reduce cost and make these markets ever Why more competitive. Is? Why is that that we haven't been able to move in that, further in that direction? It seems so obvious that it would, it would benefit both sides to have that. Change is just simply hard, and people believe that I'm responsible for protecting my consumers, and so I'm going to have my consumer protection agency that will do all of the testing on electronic goods that are imported. So it's, it's, uh, but it's the political will on both sides. That's you know. what I believe. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm hopeful is that this crisis is going to cause us to make some different decisions and cause us to think different approaches and be able to move in the direction of mutual recognition of standards and mutual recognition of testing policies, practices, and procedures and be able to make our markets even more open. It is, it is an open market. It is a huge trading partnership between the U.S. and Europe, and I don't want to imply anything else, but it can be even larger, and it can be even more effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. And, and that should be our aim. And that should be the aim. And that could be brought about if we had, if we reduced even more of the barriers that we see on both sides Indeed. Of, of the Atlantic. We're definitely building cost into a system. But we talk about how large this is. Do you have any figures you can... Four trillion dollars, a four, four trillion dollar market. That, that's, that's the movement of goods back mm -hmm. and forth on both sides, four trillion dollars. And many, that's many huge. jobs created by the foreign direct investment that goes on both sides of the Atlantic. Well, I think, uh, isn't it true that almost 75% of European investment ends up in the United States and half of ours ends up in Europe, I believe? It is. We so give significant attention to investments in India and investments in China. But the reality of it is, when you actually look at the numbers, the investments in almost any individual country of Europe, Belgium, the Netherlands, pick your example, are dramatically larger than the investments going to China or India. Well, you made a very good point there. And that is, we, we hear all the time about these investments in a China or India, particularly in China, these days. And yet, they're substantially smaller than the kinds of direct foreign investment that we see in, in, in Europe. Why do you think it is that the media, the gen popular media, the ge and, and politicians and policymakers in give so much more attention to the investment going mm -hmm. to places like China and India? Well, I think the summary indicator that we often look to is a summary indicator called growth. And so when we look at growth, and we look at growth in GDP, we simply see significant growth in China, and significant growth in India, and significant growth in Brazil. And so that attracts a great deal of attention. That incremental GDP attracts a great, you know, significant attention. But a healthy, strong, and huge trading relationship between Europe and the U.S. doesn't attract as much media attention. I, a few moments ago, uh, when I was introducing our topic here, I mentioned the Transatlantic Economic uh, Council. And I believe they have a meeting that's forthcoming later this month. Is that not right? Yes, at the end of, at the end of October. What what are the expectations for that meeting, or how might we use the TABD and the TEC to, to leverage some of the issues you've been talking about, opening these marketplaces and reducing some of the barriers? Well, former President Bush and Chancellor Merkel created the Transatlantic Economic Council, and that created a very formal forum for the exchange of ideas and the meeting of the administration with the European commissioners and creating an environment for them to address these challenges and be able to make real progress towards the vision and ambition that was put in place at the time of that treaty back in 1995. And so what I'm hopeful of is that the new administration, that the Obama administration, will be committed to the tech. And we're going through a process in Europe as well with new European commissioners mm -hmm. being put in office and for them to also be committed. And we have a huge potential, in my opinion, to take some steps forward if the tech will provide a framework for this barrier-free market that we describe. 
if they will provide a framework for avoiding protectionism and then allow the individual departments to hold themselves accountable for adopting that framework that has been articulated at the top or explaining. Do you see uh, the tech as uh, the, the should be the primary voice in speaking up about protectionism? Is that, because uh, you mentioned that, avoiding taking these protections, uh, a, a, a position that, that does devoid to protectionism in either Europe or the United States. Should, that, should they be the primary ones out there speaking on this? Or what role, let me just ask at the same time, what role can the tech play, the Transatlantic Economic Council play in bringing about an innovation society, economy on both sides of the Atlantic? Well, the whole notion of protectionism, first of all, and the role of the tech, I believe the tech can become one of the implementing vehicles for the policy statement that has been put forward effectively by our leaders at the G20. At the G20 um, against protectionism. Yeah. They've spoken very loud and very clear. clearly. Right. And so now On let's come to the next level of government and let's make that same declaration and let's put in place some accountability and some transparency related to protectionist policies and the impact that they're having. And I think leveraging some of the excellent work that the German Marshall Fund has done will help enable that process and help the tech to actually be able to have an impact there. And now on to innovation. I believe that job creation has to be one of the fundamental objectives of the tech. We need job creation in Europe and we need job creation in the U.S. And one of the sources of that is going to be innovation and growth and productivity improvements that will come with innovation. And I believe the tech can also be a facilitator in that world by protecting intellectual property rights and also facilitating, again, not only the free flow of goods and people and capital, but also the free flow of technology. How, how is the tech perceived in Europe? What do are, what are people or governments in Europe think about this, the Transatlantic Economic Council? Do they view it in a positive light or are they more aware of it than I think we are here at home? I think we're still in the early days, and I believe that broadly people see the potential, but we haven't really truly seen a long list of accomplishments yet mm -hmm. that everyone can be proud of. Mm -hmm. But because of the potential, I believe there is a commitment in Europe to work effectively through the tech to accomplish some of these goals and objectives that have been well articulated by our leaders at the G20, recent G20 summit. And I believe that's also true in the U.S. I think there's a, you know, a, a clear view of the art of the possible.